funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. All over Ireland in times past, before modernity and TV changed everything. There lived rhymers who dwelt in the countryside and created poetic verse as common and as loved as to traditional music of Ireland. Historian and folklorist PJ Riley from Four in County Westmeath. Every area had its rhymer or poet and uh, I suppose it traces its origins back to the old filly in the days of the chieftains. The wreath who is and all these, each one had their own poet. Every community had its storyteller and the storyteller passed the stories on. So it's a tradition that survived in particularly rural societies right up until the late 20th century. Rob Goodbody of the Quaker Historical Committee of Ireland. Here's County Loud local historian, folklorist and poet Noel Sharkey. You had people who had a gra and a knack for putting quatrains and verses together that would articulate their feelings on local happenings. They had a knack of crystallising the emotions and feelings and the social happenings and the fallout from social happenings in their home parish. These people recorded local events, football matches, court cases and uh, things that were important in the area was recorded in rhyme about literally anything and all local events were recorded in rhyme. And one such local rural rhymer was Patrick Higgins from the townland of Rossmore in Riverstown, County Sligo. Over the course of his life from 1875 to 1959, he wrote countless rhyming poems about his local community and the wider world beyond it. For example... In the year 1908, a man named John Stenson was shot dead by the police at a land agitation meeting in Patrick Higgins's locality. Being an observant poet, Higgins penned a poem which begins. On the 29th day of October, 1908, on a grazing ranch at Riverstown, John Stenson met his fate. He little dreamt his days were spent when entering the field, until his comrades and himself were quickly forced to yield. The bloodhounds were so thirsty, the bullets showed no lack. They didn't value human life to spare the bullets back. Their orders were to fire and shoot them if you can. We have the castle to our backs, so don't spare any man. The land agitation in which John Stenson died was part of the increased tensions in rural Ireland following the 1903 Wyndham Land Act, as indigenous Irish people sought to regain possession of their ancestral lands. Dr Patrick Cosgrove of Mary Immaculate College, Limerick, who wrote the book The Ranch War in Riverstown, County Sligo, 1908. Poems by people like uh, Higgins, they do provide a spotlight on what was happening at the ground level in rural Ireland, how big legislation like the Windermand Act was played out, the consequences it had in small communities like Riverstown in County Sligo. It just provides a ground level view of what was happening at the time and how ordinary people in these rural communities felt. Born in the year 1875, Patrick Higgins was reared in the townland of Rossmore in County Sligo, just a stone's throw from the village of Riverstown. He received his schooling in Riverstown National School and afterwards worked at various jobs, including labouring as well as farming his own small landholding. Higgins eventually married and reared his family in a cottage in Rossmore, Riverstown. To find out more, I recently talked with Riverstown local historian Hugh Kelly as he gave me a tour of his locality in his car. Patrick oh. Higgins built that house there actually, just outside Riverstown here. Um, one about mile, a mile outside. About a mile outside Riverstown. And 
his old house was there but it's, it's now gone it was a thatched house that was there and that's where a lot of his, that's where all his poetry was written and he would uh, it, most of his poetry was about events nationally internationally or the majority of them of course was about the neighbours but then some of his poems were serious like you know he wrote serious poems about McDonough's child that was a child that was killed in a road accident out of Drumfin and uh, he wrote a lovely poem about that and he, he also wrote a poem about the Spanish Civil War uh, the 1918 elections he wrote another one about that but uh, he wrote serious poems too about things like the, the making of the road here in the town land of Rossmoor As historian Hugh Kelly just touched on, through his skillful rhyming verse, Patrick Higgins recounted many of the significant events in his community and beyond. But more than anything else, his poetic output bespeaks his passionate love for his locality and neighbours. Patrick Higgins, poetry enthusiast, Antoinette Shaw. Was tradition long, long ago in Ireland. Every chieftain had a bard. So we were lucky here in Ross and Ross Moore, we had our own bard, Patrick Higgins. Patrick Higgins, he wrote lovely poems. He was gifted with a great imagination. He was, and he just called to houses and he would observe what was going on and then he would go away and write his poem. You have a guy here articulating what was happening on the ground. What is in effect doing? is describing the lifestyle they lived to, sitting around the fireside in community groups, road building, mourning the death of a child, whatever it is, it's very much a picture of the culture that he lived in, the society, the times. Higgins' is gift. He touches on subjects and on aspects of everyday living that, but for him and for his legs, would be utterly lost. Only for Patrick Higgins and his ability to write poetry, all this would be lost. It's just a very important part of local history that we we need to preserve. And we heard at the beginning of this programme how Patrick Higgins wrote a poem about the murder of John Stenson in 1908 during the so-called Riverstown Ranch War. So what were the roots of that war? Dr Patrick Cosgrove. So one of the major features was in the early 20th century was the introduction of the Wyndham Land Act in 1903 and that was named after the uh, Conservative Chief Secretary of the day, George Wyndham. And I suppose the Wyndham Land Act is probably one of the most important pieces of land legislation prior to independence in that um, it enabled millions of acres of land to change hands from landlords to tenant purchasers. So I suppose one of the major features of the Act was the fact that landlords received their purchase money in cash and they also received a 12% bonus. So that was their incentive to sell their estates. Tenants, then the incentive for them to buy was that their uh, land uh, purchase annuities would be uh, less than their current rent. So from both sides, there was incentives to purchase and for tenant farmers to become owners of their estate. So in a way, a lot of the land in Ireland was up for grabs or was or switching hands in early 20th century Ireland. This was one of the main features of that legislation. Apart from enabling landlords to sell their estates to their tenants, the Act it was uh, unique in the fact that it enabled other groups within rural Ireland to acquire a parcel of land under that Wyndham Act. So not only tenant farmers who are currently uh, residing under holdings, but other groups such as their sons, evicted tenants, agricultural labourers, other different landless groups now all had the opportunity to acquire a parcel of a land when the land commission were dividing up these estates. So the whole area of untenanted land became uh, crucial and in many areas like uh, Riverstown and particularly in Sligo the sale of untenanted land along with the tenanted land of estates became a major issue. So why did many Irish people feel so strongly about land? County Tyrone historian Brendan Holland. They saw land 
as a way of asserting their independence, if you like, because it provided, or would, in their view, have provided them with a livelihood. Land controlled everything, and the right to own land became paramount. It was this great yearning the Irish peasant had this aspiration to own the land. County Loud historian Noel Sharkey. Here's Hugh Kelly. There never would have been a revolution in this country if land wasn't <laughs> in it as it was. This, uh, people are att- so attached to the land and all wars in this country were always over land. The ranch war in Riverstown as much as any other war. The net result was activism by agitators against many of those with land. Patrick Cosgrove. There was huge interest and a growing pressure brought to bear on landlords and the people who were renting this untenanted land, normally graziers on short-term 11-month contracts in many instances. And there was huge pressure brought to bear on them to give up these lands so that they could be sold along with tenanted estates and redistributed locally among different people within areas such as Riverstown and in other rural communities throughout Ireland. And one particular landlord especially targeted by land agitators in Riverstown was John Fibbs. The key tactic the agitators used against him was cattle driving. In other words, driving Fibbs cattle off his land. On the night of the 29th of October 1908, a cattle drive was being organised in Riverstown, primarily by the leadership of the United Irish League. And John Stenson himself, who worked as a farm labourer for a Protestant farmer called John Milliken in the area, he obviously wandered into uh, Riverstown that evening after his day's work and presumably stayed on then for the events of that evening. So, in essence, cattle driving... Not only did it have a practical purpose in terms of to intimidate and to get these lands uh, divided up, but I suppose it also provided a sense of spectacle and almost like a carnival-like atmosphere where you have large groups of people, often young men, often under the direction of maybe the local leadership of the United Irish League, playing almost cat and mouse with the local RIC. So I suppose you can see the attractiveness of the prospect, you know, a night possibly spent maybe trying to outwit the RIC and to get cattle driven off these lands. So obviously on the night in question, the RIC seemed to have been aware that the the, uh, land of of, uh, John Fibbs was going to be driven. An attempt was made to be removed his cattle. So they were in wait on the uh, land in question. Um, the RIC themselves reported that shots were fired by the crowd and stones were thrown. And it, it appears that the crowd himself, you know, uh, were quite agitated and quite hostile to the relatively smaller group of RIC men who were there at the time. So the one of the policemen, possibly the sergeant in charge, uh, received a blow from a stone as part of this uh, confrontation which obviously was happening late at night in an October uh, night quite dark although I think it was a starry night at the time and he gave the order to fire at the crowd I have folklore around it I've spoken with people that remembered it I've spoken with a person a Mrs Charlton she was near Barlow and They lived in that big house now, the post office, and she was looking out the window on the night that he was shot. Riverstown local historian Hugh Kelly. And uh, they could hear all the crowd came up very noisily, but when this man was shot, they left extremely quietly. And there was no road there, so they had to walk up to the exit there, and there was a stile over here where this new road here was made, and they could go out at the bridge across the stile and all in silence. The cruel law of England will try to quash it down by bringing other claims against the men of Riverstown. But we'll make those English Saxons in all their cunning strife try the willful murderer who took John Stenson's life. That voice is stilled forever, that his country loved to hear. That manly form is vanished, that filled with hope and cheer. But he was a brave young fellow, he'll be numbered with the great. 
for he truly died a martyr like the men of 98. On the green fields of Erdcumber, on behalf of Aaron's cause, t'was in that strife he lost his life against oppressive laws. But Ireland shall ne'er forget the noble work he done. With hand and heart he led the band and stood before the gun. Patrick Higgins, he's very, very good at getting down to the nitty gritty and outlining it in very sparse, illuminating sort of phrases. The cruel law of England will try to quash it down by bringing other claims against the men of Rivertown. But we'll make those English Saxons and all the cunning strife try the willful murderer who took John Stenson's life. Noel Sharkey. It's a watershed period in Irish history. The landed estates were becoming increasingly unviable for the landlords to administer. And uh, many of them were absentees. And the resultant land acts, which enabled the tenant farmers to buy back the land, were the foundation point for everything that was to happen after. The ability to be self-sufficient, to be able to pay your way, to own the piece of ground that you farmed, that you worked on, enabled you to educate your families. It was a step up the social ladder. And it was a huge, huge driving force in the Sinn Féin movement and what happened afterwards. But the land wars were crucially important. And they're not dealt with greatly in Irish history. There's no great encyclopedia of land wars the way there is of everything that happened from the lockout in Dublin in 1913 to 1923. But it was a very pertinent period in Irish history. And again, this man nails it down. And he nails it down. He almost does what Bob Dylan does in the 1963 song about the shooting of a black civil rights worker, Major Evers. The local becomes the universal. He takes the death of this man and he magn- it, it. It's happening everywhere. You're aware that this is not just an isolated incident in County Sligo. It's the, the Thames. And uh, what local becomes universal. And it becomes very clear in the poem that this movement is unstoppable. To have the orders to fire and shoot them if you can. We have the castle at our back, so don't spare any man. But we'll make those English Saxons and all the cunning strife try the willful murderer who took John Stenson's life. They're not going to get away with this. This is not a field out in Wexford in 1798. It's not Vinegar Hill. There will be retribution enacted for this. There's boycotts, there's all this type of thing. It's a war of attrition that the Irish can win. They have the metal, they have the bit between the teeth. And the poem makes this very clear. events in, in Riverstown probably are an example of this was the growing confidence of nationalist Ireland and their willingness to, I suppose, to confront the British authorities particularly in areas like land and so on Patrick Cosgrove Obviously organisations like the United Irish League particularly in Riverstown they're basically I suppose an alternative system of government really you know almost a state within a state they can control events in their locality particularly in areas important areas such as land so you know they're almost a challenge really to the British rule in Ireland and the willingness to confront the police to confront the authorities obviously the use of firearms it is I suppose an example possibly of what is to come in later years when obviously we've 1916 and the whole revolutionary period The gradual takeover of ownership of land by the indigenous Irish populace gave them more economic muscle. With such muscle came increased political confidence and aspirations. These aspirations paved the way for the 1916 rebellion and the ensuing 1918 general election. This was a pivotal election in Irish history since John Redmond's Home Rule Irish Parliamentary Party was wiped out and the more radical Sinn Féin topped the poll. Rob Goodbody. 
the people of Ireland had gone over from supporting Redmond and constitutional politics to supporting violence and non-constitutional politics as a result of the 1916 Rising and the executions that followed. So it's in that context, as soon as the war was over, a general election was held and Sinn Féin effectively took over the whole show and they brought the whole country behind them and essentially Redmond got sidelined as a result. So the Sinn Féin cause had become really the only show in town. The Irish party was there fighting the election, but they lost it because Sinn Féin took the upper hand and managed to fight a very skillful election campaign in which, effectively, they were going to take control. Nineteen eighteen is important because it's a dramatic change in direction. Sinn Féin get a landslide and they become the voice of Irish nationalism. They offer this radicalism, we are going to be in an independent, sovereign state. The radicalism of Sinn Féin would have appealed to people like Higgins. This was something new, it was away from the Conservative. People wanted something new. Social historian James Scannell from Shankill, County Dublin. Patrick Higgins was so pleased with the results of the 1918 general election that he celebrated it in verse. The election is over and all things are done. Three cheers for Sinn Féin and the victory they won. Three cheers for the heroes who supported the cause and fought for old Erin to make her own laws. Too long we are fettered and tied up in chains. Tis time that Sinn Féin should get hold of the reins. Tis time that old Ireland would open her eyes and raise the old banner aloft in the skies. Raise it aloft till the tyrants would see that we'll stick to our colours till Ireland is free. Our leaders were captured and rammed into jail. They refused a fair trial and would not get bail. John Redmond had promised, he told us at least, they would give us home rule when the war would have ceased. They soon broke their pledges and nothing was done as far back as ever when victory is won. Home rule is abandoned. We'll beg it no more. But we'll have a republic and guard our own shore. The outgoing members can now go to bed. Themselves and home rule got a knock on the head. We won't have them much longer to keep us in pain. We can find better leaders among the Sinn Féin. We'll drink a good health to the boys who are in jail, and we'll welcome them back in Aaron's Green Vale. With Salta and Salta, and Cade Mila Falcha, we'll welcome them under the flag of Sinn Féin. It's a great poem. It's very clear and succinct, and gives a very concise rundown on the political situation in Ireland that had fostered Sinn Féin and that had enabled them to step into history with a vengeance at this point. County Loud historian and poet Noel Sharkey. Here's Rob Goodbody. It's very much a poem of victory. Victory over a vanquished Redmond. Uh, there's some extent of it. There's a victory against Britain, but it's, it's largely a poem against Redmond. During his life... Patrick Higgins became renowned in his locality as the bard of the people, the voice of the common man and woman. Those who cut turf in the bogs, laboured long hours in the fields, built the local roads, and oftentimes struggled to raise their families against overwhelming poverty. Higgins was so much the people's poet that often his neighbours would ask him to write poems for them. For example, after their child was knocked down by a car and killed, the Macdonalds asked him to write a poem in commemoration of their deceased boy. These lines I have penned were composed for a friend, but they won't give the father much joy. It's hard but to think 
that the death broke the link with this, his darling and dear little boy. This dear little boy was their pride and their joy, the pride of his mother and dad. Death came as a knock and a terrible shock and captured the poor little lad. Now the young and the old, they are cautioned and told that the road, it can sometimes cause grief for the angel of death is knocking around and sometimes he comes like a thief. If the baby could talk to his daddy, these words he would say, Tell mammy not weep while her baby's asleep, for I'm with the angels today. It's a very difficult subject to tackle. He tackles the death of a child and he writes the poem for the family. And it's a poem, his subject matter can very easily tumble into schmaltz and sentimentality. And somehow he doesn't. Noel, Sharkey. It's like Phil Coulter's scorn or his implicity. The definitive version is by Luke Kelly and those other very schmaltzy versions done. But scorn or his implicity, it's a song that could have failed because of the author's closeness to the subject matter he imbues it with emotion and this is a poem that i imagine he didn't have to deliberate very long it was written from pure emotion yet it doesn't tumble into sentimentality it doesn't fail it succeeds and it succeeds on many counts he has great alliteration you know, he talks about it's hard but to think, but the death broke the link with this, his darling and dear little boy. He knows how many words he needs in the last lane. He knows exactly and intuitively the amount of expressions he needs to not kill the thing with kindness, but to measure it out properly, to space it, to imbue it with music. That it, not just that it rhymes, but that it's a perfectly constructed little lullaby. And uh, it's another example of Higgins' gift and how to a whole series of circumstances, but notably the one of not getting his stuff into print and into circulating libraries, how he's so unfairly forgotten today. Many of Patrick Higgins' poems abound with local place names and characters. A perfect example of one such place-centred Higgins poem is called The Rossmore Fires, which details in a humorous manner the cold winter of 1924 and how locals tried to survive it. Before we hear the poem, here's Riverstown historian Hugh Kelly to explain the background to it. The year was 1924. It was an exceptionally wet year and uh, the hay wasn't got until the month of November and the turf wasn't got at all. So uh, he put pen to paper on you. I like to take a ramble when my daily work is done to go out among the neighbours and enjoy a piece of fun. The season, it was rainy, bleak and rather tough and the people were all perished when they couldn't get the turf. I went one night to Hevers, but the night I can't forget, for the aspect of the fire there, it was an awful fret. When I went into the kitchen, it was on the chair I sat. He had a lump of Sally down to try and boil the pot. Hevers' sole ambition was to try and make a joke, for he knew the timber Sally would create a lot of smoke. The villain, he was laughing, but he kept it in disguise when he saw the water running like a fountain from my eyes. The two of us were chilly, but of course we're getting old. He couldn't stick his own house. He was perished with the cold. He said, 
We'll go up to Kelly's. I consented on the spot. But I couldn't see the fire there. It was covered with the pot. The pot, it was a big one, and it nearly set us wild. You'd imagine if it was twice as big, it couldn't but be boiled. Hugh was in the corner, and he seemed to be at his ease, as he kept the tongs poking, thinking he'd raise a blaze. But the fire kept on munging, and indeed it wasn't hot. But how the devil could it be? Sure it was covered with the pot. But now they've got warning, and a good one, sure enough. So I bet a dollar next year, they'll try and save the turf. Hugh, we've just arrived in now to a beautiful... Just give our listeners, Hugh, a word picture of where we are now at the we're, moment. We're in the house that they left from Heifers that night and came up to this house. To, uh, 1924. Aye, ah, 1924. Hoping that things would have improved fire-wise, but I'm afraid they didn't improve fire-wise. Because apart from being covered with a pot, he was trying to rise a flame out of the fire. That would be my grandfather. And he wasn't able to do it because the... Sally or anything like that, as they would have been burning at the time, whatever was available around the garden, and it wouldn't have been seasoned properly or anything, so it was very impossible to raise a spark from it, so Patrick Higgins couldn't let the opportunity pass, so he had to write that. The plight of these people here, who have no fire, who have no turf, is mirrored all around the county and all around the country. You know, it's a marvellous poem. And it's something that's not dealt with. You have a guy here articulating what was happening on the ground. It's not something that was a national pro- it was a national problem, but it was an underground one. It's not something that made the newspapers. But it, it was the dilemma facing the ban on tea. You know, how could the cook, that no turf, turf governed everything. It wasn't just a question of heat, it was a question of cooking, of warming milk, um, of everything, you know. And it, it's a poem that should be far better known. It should be featured in anthologies. It's very sadly overlooked. Noel Sharkey. And at this juncture in my investigation of Patrick Higgins' poem, The Rossmore Fires, I decided to pay a visit to the Kelly House, which features in the poem. Here's who I met there. Antoinette Shaw, formerly Kelly from Rossmore, Riverstone County, Sligo. Now, we're actually in the Kelly house, which Patrick Higgins would have visited to engage in fireside chat with the neighbours, so to speak. Am I right? That's right, yes. People used to ramble and this was a great house for music and singing, so it would have been very attractive for the neighbours to call. And Antoinette Shaw also had this to say regarding Patrick Higgins' poem about the harsh winter of 1924. Only for Patrick Higgins and his ability to write poetry, all this would be lost. You know, it was, he was he the real voice. He told the story in poetic form, and we have it now for our archives and, and to pass it on to ne- the next generations. And Antoinette, you were saying that, you know, when you were growing up, you were brought up with these poems, you know, they were kind of on the tip of everyone's tongue in the locality. That's, Am that's I right? True. That's true, yes. And we loved listening to them, listening to the adults. That time, children sat in a quiet corner and they weren't heard but you just listened to the poems and you would be totally intrigued by them and maybe you might ask your father to explain the story behind the poem so that's how they're living on it's great isn't it and it's the real he kind of he was the voice of the people the bard of the people in a way am I right yes absolutely which is was tradition long, long ago in Ireland. Every chieftain had a bard. So we were lucky here in Ross and Ross Moore, we had our own bard, Patrick Higgins. One of Patrick Higgins' more celebrated poems is called The Ross Moore Road about a local road-building employment scheme which the poet himself partook in in 1924, tasked with building a road through the remoter parts of his native Rossmore. To discover more 
I rendezvous with local historian Hugh Kelly on location at the Rossmore Road. The road started over there in Conway's land and it was in 1924 and it was an unemployment scheme that they were working. But the one thing about Patrick Higgins, he worked on it himself and he had either a horse and cart or a donkey and cart on it. And of course, he did a lot of, we did this and that, we business was through it. And before we hear some of Patrick Higgins' poem, The Rossmore Road, here's Rob Goodbody to put it in its correct historical context. Unemployment was huge in Ireland for the first 40, 50 years after independence because we had a population who was dwindling, but it was still a significant population, and there just weren't the jobs. The economy was not good at the time. world economy in the 20s wasn't particularly good, but Ireland was not an industrialised economy at the time, and the government instigated employment schemes to get people back to work. And it was while working on one such employment scheme that Patrick Higgins was inspired to write his poem, The Rossmore Road, which begins. Come all you friends and neighbours and listen to my song. It's short and interesting and I won't detain you long. Some money it was granted and a promise of some more to make a section of a road in the townland of Rossmore. It was on a Monday morning the gaffer and his men arrived at Teddy's quarry, the work for to begin. About fifty men assembled and formed in a mob and each man taught himself the best entitled to a job. The times were not too hurried, being the slack time of the year and when they heard about the Rossmore Road they flocked from far and near. They came from every quarter and assembled to a man, from Drumdoney and from Drum Column and all the way from Glan. And because the Rossmore Road poem is too long to give in full here, we'll instead give the last portion of it in which Patrick Higgins talks about his work colleagues and also the mechanics of road building in rural Sligo in 1924. Now about poor Derby, he earned well his bit. He got his pick and shovel and was sent up to the pit. The dab, it was tenacious and was pretty hard to work. He soon got an assistant, for we sent him Andrew Burke. Andrew, with his shovel, he soon cut up a shine, and every cart before I'd start, he'd ask me, what's the time? Now I think it's time to tell you how we had to make the road. Myself and Tim could almost swim in Ulock on the road. The road was sort of slanting, with a slope up on the hill. The men had to keep digging dab, the lower side to fill, with rushes and whin bushes and black sally mixed with crab, we sold the road completely and finished it with the dab. The gaffer is no amateur in making roads he's skilled, for every swamp and hollow with dab he got it filled. The water tables he got sunk and placed it on the top, and he made the road an oval shape, to cast away the drop. Now to conclude and finish, to my friends I bid adieu, if we live so long we'll sing this song when the Rossmore Road runs through. They made the road anyway, and he describes how it was made, which is very important. Some of the words that we will hear in it, we may not understand today because uh, they're <laughs> they're of their time. What um, kind of words like like you look and dab and what what, what, what is you look? Uh, it was it's when clay and dab get wet and there comes this awful mix and you go to your neck in it and that f- formed in the hollows in the road 
And so in other words, you were up to, to your neck in mud. That had to be filled with dab, what we call, it's the second layer under the clay. Well, that had to be taken out of the ditches and brought forward with the donkey and cart before they stoned it at all. Do you know that that, that would have been done? But as as well as that, that put wind bushes and they put crab, apple trees into it and they put rushes. They put everything into it until they got it to a certain level, until they got it like a dirt track, and then they the worked on it. And even saying it, how they made it higher in the centre to cast away the drop. Like, you know, that the roads were well made, like they didn't have the centre of the road low so that the water would flow into it. They had it high and they made the drains each side, as you can see. Hugh Kelly. Here's Rob Goodbody once again. The crest of the road has to be in the middle with a slope on either side except in extreme circumstance where you've got a where you're going up a hill or something like that the water's going to run off anyway but normally on a on a level you have a high point in the middle of the road but you still want the water to run off it and when Patrick Higgins was, uh, talks about and he made the road an oval shape to cast away the drop but well, that I'm taking it is an oval as in it's sort of sloping up around it or down the other side it's like it's rounded in, in some form that's the way he uh, puts it to cast away the drop is so the water can run off it uh, so he describes it uh, fairly uh, well he says he laid the road completely and finished it with dab now dab seems to be from the context in here uh, to be a fine material probably a, a mud base rather than a, a powder and I'm even wondering here whether this is the same word as daub when building a structure in ancient times a wattle and daub you, wattle was a woven mat of willow or similar twigs to form a panel and then you plastered it over with moistened mud just, just using it as a plaster that was the daub and I can't help wondering because of the sounds of what he's saying in the poem is that it seems to be a mud that he's using and they're spreading it on the surface isn't that just like plastering a wattle screen Although Patrick Higgins passionately loved his locality and its populace inside out, being the ever-observant poet of the world around him, he also wrote verse about global and international happenings, a prime example being his 1937 poem, The Spanish Civil War. No wonder the world is weeping. The people are all very sad. The way the war is raging... It would bring down the anger of God. The boys are fighting the battle. The labour will not be in vain. They will banish the godless heathens that are murdering the priests out in Spain. When Christ gave the keys to St. Peter, he told him to look over his flock. I preach you the faith to all nations. For the true church is built on a rock. He also gave them this message when he was among them on earth. Behold, I am with you forever, as I was from the day of my birth. Some people imagine they're fighting to try to get worldly gain, and that this is the cause of the conflict they're having today out in Spain. This is not the cause of the conflict. Their object is cruel and bad. They are out to wipe out religion and trample right over their God. They will fall like leaves in the forest. And then they will die in disgrace for the terrible deeds they committed. They will answer the Lord face to face. It's a poem very much of his time when he talks about the boys are fighting the battle, the labour will not be in vain, they will banish the godless heathens that are murdering the priests out in Spain. Now, 
he's basically taken Franco's side here. And he's reacting to the news that is filtering back to them. He doesn't have the benefit of the analysis of the Spanish Civil War that we have today from all the writings about it. And so it's very definitely he's painting it as a religious war. Now, the reality what happened in Spain there was that there was general election and the left-wingers won. And so a left-wing parliament took over in Spain and there was a right-wing reaction against that led by Franco. And so there was a revolution in Spain where the right-wingers basically rose up against a left-wing parliament. So contrary to what sometimes the impression you get, Franco was the rebel and he was seizing power from a properly elected left-wing government. Rob Goodbody of the Quaker Historical Committee of Ireland. Here's County Tyrone historian Brendan Holland. It was viewed by most Irish people as a war of paganism versus religion because that's how the church chose to represent socialism as the end of Christianity and so on and so forth, which is totally overblown, over the top. The people that were fighting in Spain against fascism, they weren't fighting against religion. They were fighting against fascism. But because Franco and his allies, you know, courted the church and this society in which, uh, you know, this, you've got to understand Spanish society was so much of the wealth was in very few hands. And that's why people went to war about it, because they wanted a more equitable society. Um, today's church wouldn't take the same view, of course, but in the 1930s it did. And that found resonance in this country because of the influence and the power that the church held in 1930s Ireland. So Patrick Higgins is reflecting that. And this is the beauty about local poets. Higgins, that they're not just talking about events. Local historian Jim Rees from Arklow, County Wicklow. You can actually read the mindset of the locality, of a group, certainly of an individual, the individual who wrote it, but he's summing up what's there. It says as much about rural Ireland at the time as it says about the conflict in Spain. All readings of Patrick Higgins' poetry in this documentary are by John Sibbery. In the year of our Lord 1959, Patrick Higgins died and went to his maker. He was over 80 years of age. So what is the ultimate legacy of Patrick Higgins and rural rhymers like him, who abounded all over Ireland in times past, before modernity and TV changed everything? County Loud poet Noel Sharkey. To communicate a lost civilization, a lost civilization in the sense that its needs, its problems, its social difficulties, they articulated and outlined a style of living, a whole series of preoccupations, and striving for very survival that needs to be said, that needs to be preserved, that without them, would be lost irretrievably because you won't get this stuff in contemporary coverage of the time and uh, they're an invaluable source of reference if one wants to understand the Ireland of the time and Ireland that they lived through. So often what we have written down has been written down by intellectuals who've been studying a, a local group. Rob, good buddy. Or somebody's written it down in a novel, maybe very skillfully described how things were. Maybe somebody from that locality who's written it down very skillfully in a novel. But each little bit, whether it's done as a newspaper account, an academic account, a novel, or a folk poem written by somebody like Patrick Higgins, they all add up to the sum total of the heritage of local culture and local society as it was.
funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.